Sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, wir haben Sie warten gelassen, weil an gewissen Medien der Beginn auf 18.15 angesagt wurde. Es freut mich, dass Sie hier sind. Mein Name ist Christian Blaser. Ich heiße Sie willkommen im Namen der Architekturdialoge Basel. Welcome, David Chipperfield. We are happy to have you here in Basel. Einführend möchte ich Ihnen ein paar Worte zur Stiftung und zu unseren Anlässen sagen. Die Stiftung Architekturdialoge Basel hat drei Gefäße. Das eine ist eine kleinere Reihe, thematisch, Architektur und eben etwas. Das findet dreimal im Jahr statt. Dann die Architekturvorträge, große Namen in großen Rahmen, würde ich jetzt mal sagen. Und dann die Agenda, welche wir auf dem Web und als Mail Interessierten zur Verfügung stellen. Ähm, am Ausgang sollte so ein Flyer liegen, wo man sich auch eintragen kann, für die, die äh, noch nicht internetfähig oder überhaupt einfach interessiert sind. Und wir sind, äh, stellen Ihnen äh, das Architekturgeschehen in und um Basel gerne äh, in dieser Form zur Verfügung. Unsere Stiftung ist unterstützt, so etwas braucht es, von der Firma Regent Lighting über mehrere Jahre. Wir sind darüber sehr glücklich. Nun, die Architekturvorträge, diese Reihe, die wir hier heute einen, einen Anlass haben, die besteht schon seit eigentlich 28 Jahren und immer wieder haben weltbekannte Architekten in Basel den Weg gefunden, einen Vortrag zu halten. Die größte Opportunität, die sich in diesen Jahren bietet, sind Architekten, welche im Novartis Campus bauen, äh, anzufragen, ob sie uns live zur Verfügung stehen und uns etwas über sich und ihre Bauten erzählen werden. Nach Tadao Ando äh, präsentieren wir eben heute David Chipperfield und es ist geplant, dass wir diese Reihe in den nächsten Jahren mit ein bis zwei Vorträgen pro Jahr äh, weiterführen und äh, die Namen, äh, ich glaube, die sind äh, bekannt, aber die reichen äh, oder die beinhalten natürlich äh, 20 äh, weltbekannte äh, Architekten. Für eine solche Veranstaltung braucht es neben der Ideologie ein paar Menschen, die so etwas äh, organisieren, natürlich auch äh, Sponsoren und äh, auch eine Absprache mit Novartis, äh, welcher wir auch danken, dass sie äh, da mit uns mitmacht. Herzlich danken möchte ich auch der Swissbau, welche diese Anlässe seit äh, vielen Jahren hostet, sponsert und uns eine Plattform zur Verfügung stellt. Im Jahr 2010, im Januar, findet dann die nächste große Swissbau statt. Auch hier hoffen wir wieder mit einer äh, guten Veranstaltungsreihe und Aktionen in und um die Architektur bereit zu sein und Ihnen was zu bieten. Für diese Veranstaltung konnten wir auch ein weiteren Sponsor noch finden, die Enf-Aufzüge, äh, da steht mehr als ein Lift, äh, das ist es auch, die sponsern uns eben, äh, konnten wir da gewinnen. Auch besten Dank. Nun zu, ganz kurz zu David Chipperfield and now I switch to English because I want to know what uh, I say about him. Um, David Chipperfield um, worked after his studies at Richard Rogers and Norman Foster and opened his own office in 1984 in London, Berlin. That time he had an office in uh, Japan. Now he runs also an office in Milano and uh, in a representative office in Shanghai, China. His major buildings um, I heard he will not talk about too many, but um, includes buildings all over the world. He is working, I counted that on your website, about on 30 different buildings. Um, 
David Chipperfield's architecture composes from tradition, history, and three fundamental elements, space, light, and material. With the space, he follows function with the light. Uh, he brings light into the space by a great leadership of daylight, the aspect of daylight. And the material is mostly uh, of natural uh, material. In Basel, he is currently building an uh, office building on the Novartis campus. Um, it's under construction. Of seen it rising and uh, it should be uh, uh, given over to the client by 2009 and very recently um, you may know it from the medias he won the competition of the addition of the Kunsthaus in Zürich and um, I want to say here that there have been uh, 214 uh, offices that were applying to participate on the competition. 20 were selected and he won the first prize. Congratulations, David Chipperfield. And now let's welcome David Chipperfield to his first lecture, at least in Basel. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's always uh, nervous for foreign architects to talk in Switzerland because we have a sort of inferiority complex about the quality of architecture that comes from Switzerland. Um, I'm going to talk really about one project, a project which we've been working on for 11 years. and. Uh, can I go to the first slide? Okay. Oh, it's gone too far. Okay. Um, I think many architects have projects that they, they've had for 11 years um, because projects inevitably get slowed down, they stop, they start again. But the noise museum, the rebuilding of the noise museum in Berlin has been 11 years work for us and it's been the most extraordinary experience and uh, we will complete the building next year, it will open in about one year's time. Um, I want to talk about the process of, of uh, rebuilding the building and <clears throat> I would also talk about the master plan of the museum island. Um, in that description, I would like to talk a little bit about um, our attitude to uh, ruins. And <coughs> I suppose that uh, uh, it, when, when faced with uh, such a destroyed building, there are very complex considerations to make about how one approaches the reconstruction. Uh, exactly 100 years after the stone laying in 1843, Allied bombs hit the Noyes Museum and began the Noyes Museum's second history as a ruin. The bombing of 1943 and 1945 initiated the process of ruinification. More than 60 years later, we stood in a building that strangely seemed to have survived beyond that dreadful destruction, and through a strange series of conditions, it, has been allowed to it was allowed to decompose in a most natural way. It is perhaps this dimension of organic decay that softened the casualty of war and all the horror that it represented into a monument of strange beauty. Over the last 11 years, we've worked with this wonderful building. None of us knew the building before the bombs. We can only begin to imagine what a beautiful building Stuller gave to Berlin. There is enough left for us to understand its quality and his vision. When we started on the project, I often discussed the quality of the building as a ruin. Those of us... Sorry. Um, 
those of us that have worked with, within, this, within, within its rubble for all these years cannot avoid its spell. But what good was a ruin to us? We neither want a ruin nor do we want a testament to the causes of its ruination. Apart from a romantic appreciation of its condition, what, what, quality, <clears throat> what can this quality be uh, uh, used to us? Some critics have stated that I wanted to preserve destruction. This is absolutely not true. The bombs not only damaged the building, it took away its natural history. It has been locked in an environment where its relationship to use, history, and decay have been artificially modified. We needed to reloc relocate the building in history. It needed therapy and it needed to be relocated in time. During the project, we've always argued that we have no interest in showing destruction. Where we are interested in preserving, not reconstructing. But what we want to preserve is not damage, but what remains of Stiller's original masterpiece. We resist at all costs the idea of submerging the original, authentic remains of Stiller's building into a synthetic recreation of the original. Not because of some sort of historical didactic, but out of respect of the archaeology that remains. I want to show a few slides about ruins and their influence on art and our idea of history. I started looking at the role that ruins have played in our history because I wanted to understand what legitimacy we have in the Noise Museum to consider that its role as a ruin should play any part in our conceptual process. The first slides I will show try to comment on the role of ruins in our history. The ruins of Egypt, Rome, Greece stimulated our fascination for classical civilizations. I became interested in how the ruin and its representation has played an important role in our idea of cultural continuity and how it seems to occupy a special role between architecture and nature. Um, sorry. When we, um, I'm going to go here so I can point. When we uh, inherited the project, it was very, um, we were nervous that we were going to um, spend 10 years doing not much more than um, you know, a, a restoration project. The building, as you can see, this, these are slides of uh, the condition of the building when uh, we uh, assumed uh, our role in 1997. Uh, the building had been stabilized. Um, the strange condition that existed was that while all of the museums on the Museum Island, uh, in the image I showed at the beginning, while all of them had been bombed, uh, all of them, with the exception of Noise Museum, had been repaired and, and rebuilt. Noise Museum stood uh, in uh, its ruined state until the wall came down in 1989. The GDR had planned to do a historical reconstruction. Historical reconstruction means that you build back a copy of what was there, a reconstruction uh, typology that we've seen many, many times. The building itself, because of, its, because of very particular conditions, um, resisted an easy reconstruction before that. The building had been stabilized. You can see here, this is the um, uh, southwest wing, which from the outside is still, is, was quite complete, but you can see there was stabilizing uh, work done. Uh, this actually represents three floors. The bomb had come through here and destroyed uh, all three floors. But you can see even in this uh, image that there are uh, architectural fragments. Sorry, I'm going to go back just quickly. You can see that there are places where, um, you know, pieces of the, uh, the architecture survive, and you can see places where pieces of the uh, decoration survive. But similarly, you can find places where the spaces themselves have been destroyed, and at the most extreme, uh, two parts of the building <coughs> completely missing. Sorry, gone too far. Um, we were, from the beginning, fascinated by the extraordinary 
physical quality that the Noyes Museum offered as in its ruined state. And as I said before, <coughs> one was sort of cautious about uh, how romantic this was because uh, clearly we could no longer, we couldn't uh, maintain the ruin. Clearly the commission was to restore the building in some way so that it could function as a 21st century <coughs> museum with full environmental control and, um, and facilities. So what role does the idea of ruin play in the whole thing? Uh, there, were, there are two things that briefly I want to touch on as an introduction. First of all, there is this tradition <coughs> of, um, this is Caspar David Friedrich, the painting which sits in the National Gallery. These are <coughs> wonderful photographs by Roger Fenton. Um, this is River Abbey in uh, the north of England. Uh, in this case, uh, sort of Gothic ruins. <coughs> so I was, these slides are just talking about um, and offering up this question about why, why are ruins so uh, potent to us? What, what do ruins contain <coughs> that makes us uh, sort of fascinated by them? And of course, within our work, uh, we had to consider to what degree uh, those considerations might play a part in our conceptual process. This is Pyrenees' drawings of the bars of Caracalla. <coughs> and this is um, Gandhi's drawing for Sone of the Bank of England. And more interestingly, this is Gandhi's drawing of the Bank of England <coughs> as a construction site, but in a way as a sort of uh, elemental uh, architecture. So this is before the decorative skin goes on. And I think why this, is, this image is so interesting um, is that clearly uh, Soane was, was fascinated by <coughs> the bones of architecture, and that's why he, he continuously commissioned Gandhi to draw his buildings um, in a sort of semi-finished state. And here is the Bank of England, not semi-finished, but nearly semi-destroyed. Imagining the, the Bank of England as a ruin, and I suppose qualifying that test that <coughs> you know, a good building makes a good ruin, that the, the test of a great piece of architecture is that it could survive as a great ruin. And this was sown uh, using Gandhi's graphic skills to play with that idea. Um, clearly, it's a, it's a tradition within painting, the whole picturesque tradition, Claude Lorraine, and the idea of uh, you know, classical uh, ruins, the idea of antiquity, and the idea of a sort of continuity. Um, in England, there was a very fascinating period to do with the picturesque, definition of picturesque. This is William Kent playing with <coughs> um, ruins in the landscape follies, and all of that game between nature and architecture. <coughs> so I just go to the next one. <coughs> As a sort of um, introduction or termination of that idea of, of the, the classical, the con continuity of <coughs> ruins, the fact that we became, through the Renaissance, uh, fascinated by architectural ruins and ruins as a symbol of lost civilizations. Here is uh, Frederick William the Force uh, sketch for this idea of the Museum Island in Berlin, Berlin as a sort of new Athens, Athens on the spray, the establishment of a, a sort of new uh, cultured Prussian um, state with this sort of <coughs> Greek wedding cake um, architecture. Anyway. But a very clear, and, and that's in a way what, not, what the, I mean, that, <coughs> that is sort of what happened on, on the Museum Island. It did become a, a, 
a piling up of buildings that refer to a classical tradition, and obviously, most importantly, Schinkel's out of museum. So I'm going to go the other way. Which one are you pointing this? Um, <coughs> the other less um, romantic consideration is the idea of destruction and ruination. And the cause of the ruination, in this case, this is Schinkel's Alters Museum after the war. This is the great portico <coughs> that was bombed. Um, and here we have a you know, the, the dealing with the destruction of, of, of war and the, the ruination of the buildings through the process of war. And <coughs> coming back to my own town, this was meant to be a slide of the area around St. Paul's, and it's not quite. I think this is a view from St. Paul's. I think it is. Um, and London obviously suffered from incredible uh, blitz. And the immediate post-war um, rhetoric was about uh, tabula rasa, it was about building again, about the phoenix. Uh, Lewis Mumford wrote a fantastic, uh, the romantic essay about making sense out of this destruction. And here we have a, a, a sort of seminal project from that period which was the Paternoster Square development built round, sorry, built round the uh, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, um, and a sort of new urban space made possible in a way by this incredible destruction, um, and a brave new world, and architects, and we, we, we uh, produced the most uh, bleak and desolate uh, urban spaces at this time in, in, in our bomb cities in Plymouth, Southampton, Coventry, um, and, and in London. And the, this project was a very clear example of that. Uh, and anecdotally, interestingly enough, <coughs> um, that was cleared away again 10 years ago. Here, in fact, you can see the two spires that you saw before. Um, so. The 50s project was, was taken down, and this is a recent project trying to make uh, city structure again. So sort of the whole thing went round. In, <coughs> in contrast, in Warsaw, here you have the destruction of the city, and then you have a, uh, a sort of a imitation uh, and a rebuilding of, the, of the, the fabric in a much more convenient way, and, and a way that uh, continues the idea, even though you know it's heavily criticised in, in many ways it, for the fact that it's a it's a copy, but uh, there are you know so there were two ways of, of thinking about this uh, relationship to rebuilding, and then um, this discussion, <coughs> which has existed in Germany and well it's existed in all societies, but highly articulated in Germany when, you know, beginning with the rebuilding of, of, uh, of Goethe's house in Frankfurt uh, in the 1950s. This is the uh, Gedankenskirche in uh, Egon Eymann's project where he protected, preserved the, the church spire as a, as a ruin. Here is the Frankenkirche in Dresden. And uh, most contentiously, I guess, at the moment, uh, is the rebuilding of the Berliner Schloss <coughs> Uh, a decision made by the German uh, parliament uh, to, to instruct the German government to rebuild um, a copy, a complete copy. Um, the jury is this week. Um, and of course, this discussion about loss and rebuilding and, and uh, the role of architecture in this, this discussion, I think, is a fascinating one. And it's, and it's it's one that, in a way, doesn't go away in Germany. When we began the project, looking at the extreme positions uh, with historical reconstruction on the one hand, and let me jump, if 
further. This is Carlo Scarpa. The other tradition, I suppose, of um, making contrast between uh, what remained and what was added, the idea of, uh, of uh, you know, in a way, enjoying the gap on the one hand, um, uh, or on the other hand, uh, a historical copy, if you take those two as, as extremes. Um, we uh, were nervous about the, the discontinuity of, let's call it the Scarpa approach, the idea of uh, counterpointing old and new, and the, in our opinion, the unacceptable idea of a historical copy. Um, and then along comes Dolgast with the extraordinary project of the Neue Pinakothek in, in Munich, where Dolgast has repaired the building and continued the, the idea of the building, the formal idea, the, the, the massive idea, and to some degree the material idea, without resorting to a, um, a simulated imitation of the original. This was, was very critical to us as a, a way into the project. So Dolgas was really um, a clue. The condition of Noyes Museum has this paradoxical problem of having pieces which are in very good condition and can be quite easily restored and are clear fragments of the original building and we have missing parts. And the, the idea that has, in a way, motivated our approach is the idea that we must give back sense and order to the fragments. And we must make some idea of, of, of wholeness, but we shouldn't lose either the authenticity of the fragments uh, by the way that we repair them, nor should we lose their, their authority by the way that we uh, fill the gaps. Uh, this is a, a technique well understood in archaeology. There is no confusion about this approach. The fragments exist. From the fragments you can deduce form. You can recomplete the form. You can understand the location of the fragments as opposed to just having fragments laying on a table. Um, and you, but you, you hesitate before you, you decorate these parts with the missing uh, story. However seducing, seductive it may be to draw a little horse's legs and uh, other details that you might be able to deduce, you don't do it. Um, and nor do you, in, uh, this is the restoration of the Leonardo's Last Supper, you can see extraordinary uh, damage in some ways, but it's accepted that in painting restoration, you don't, you, you try and suppress the effect of damage. You take areas like this <coughs> where the blue has been lost and then you can patch the blue in and all of a sudden the form of the, the costume or the face or so, but what you don't do is sort of re repaint or reinvent Simon's nose. So, <clears throat> when we started, this is what we started with, uh, a building which had been stabilized uh, prior to 1989, in the, in the uh, early years of the 80s, uh, later years of the 80s. Uh, it had been uh, cleaned up a bit. This whole wing is missing. This corner is missing. The staircase was completely bombed. The photograph I showed you earlier on with the three floors cut through is on this wing, which from outside seems uh, in a reasonable condition, but actually was quite destroyed. The, the building sits in a strange uh, location with the other buildings of the Museum Island, although if you think about the chronology, it's not quite so strange. Here's 
Schinkel's uh, Altus Museum, the, the beginning of the story, uh, the, the National Gallery, and the, the Noise Museum. They are so connected with a, with a colonnade here and are linked sort of tangentially along the edge of, of uh, Schinkel's Alters Museum to the Lustgarten and the Schloss here. The Pergamon and the Bode Museum came later and actually are rather disconnected. You have, in order to reach these museums, you have to come off the island and enter them. When we won the competition, there, there was an idea, or it was actually part of the brief, that Noyes Museum would become a sort of entrance building because it was so destroyed. It was envisaged that there was flexibility in its rebuilding that we could build um, you know, bookshops and ticket halls and cloakrooms and all those things that the Museum Island doesn't have. And we could link through that building into the other buildings and create some sort of bridging process. We argued once we had um, won the competition and taken over responsibility for the building, we argued that this building could not be invested with that responsibility. And <coughs> from that came a larger master plan to deal with the infrastructural issues. And I'll show that later. Here's an, another view of the building. This is, a, this is a photograph, I think, in the 60s, 70s. You can see <coughs> the missing uh, southeast corner and you can see <coughs> the staircase hall destroyed here. You can see that's where the bomb went through on the, the southwest wing. And you can see the, the other museums <coughs> sort of repaired and restored and the colonnade put back into place. <coughs> the remnants of the colonnade in front of Noise Museum. The, at the competition, <coughs> We proposed that the first responsibility was to put back the form of the building, the mass of the building, and the building uh, spaces. <coughs> so as I described through the Greek vase idea, that we have uh, fragments and pieces of original building here and here and here. <coughs> And then we connect and bring these fragments back together. We recreate uh, the rooms in the same proportion as the historic uh, form. We create the silhouette and we create the mass. Uh, and we try to bring this all together. We were really not interested in a building that counterposed intervention and uh, historic fabric. We didn't want to see the project as a series of contrasts. We wanted to see the building as a continuous whole tied together by new interventions. This is a cut through the three major spaces, the staircase hall, the Egyptian courtyard and the Greek courtyard. I will explain in a minute that the the variation of scale of destruction, which goes from, on the one hand, small missing patches of plaster, to on the other hand, missing parts of the building, complete wings missing, requires us to find a strategy and techniques that bring those things together. Here's a cut through the more, uh, uh, the, the east side, which was slightly less damaged, uh, this is the um, North Dome Room, which was in reasonable condition. Near Biedensaal, through the staircase, the, the Roman Room, and the completely missing um, uh, South Dome. And just as an example, uh, so this is a new construction. We needed, we felt we needed, to re-establish externally the dome to match the original, but we didn't want to copy the missing dome, so we had to, in this case, invent a sort of modern interpretation. And that uh, 
That level of intervention happens three or four times in the building. It happens in the staircase in some ways. It happens in the Egyptian uh, hall and it happens in the missing dome. This was <coughs> Stuhler's great staircase, a wonderful um, uh, space which nearly has a sort of, uh, a sort of nearly an external quality to it. You arrive from the front door, you come up, and this is the main exhibition floor. This is it just after the war, completely destroyed, just the steel frames left of the Ectam copy. You can see a bit of a door frame still here and the traces of the stair here and here. Um, not only did the building suffer from the bombs, it suffered then also, of course, from another 60 years of, of rain damage and you know, subsequent damage from the elements. This is the condition of the staircase hall uh, when we began. The, 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 f the floor had completely been destroyed, so we had a sort of Pyrenaean space that went from the basement all the way to the roof. The opportunities that existed in this space um, <coughs> were enormous, and we were encouraged in two different ways. One from the, from the, the Denkmar Flega to really do historical copy in some ways, or at least to, to do a solution very much based on, on the original stair. And of course, you can imagine there are uh, very vociferous um, lobbies in, uh, in Berlin that have always wanted this building to be restored in its original. Um, we worked for uh, nearly, a nearly a year on this space and different alternatives. And finally, we decided that the, the room should, well, I should just explain a little bit. I mean, the, yeah, but that it should, it should remain as an austere space, that it's the one space that would, should very much show the level of ruination that the building received. I should say, that I, and I will show very briefly, the process by which we have, um, the methods by which we've, we've repaired the building um, have been based on, first of all, we've documented every surface, photographically documented every surface. We've done drawings, drawings have been done of each surface. This is a type of drawing, of course, documenting the condition. You can see in this, sorry, um, that uh, repairs were made during the GDR time. We had to take those, a lot of those areas of brickwork out and um, in a way clean the ruin. This is the final and accepted scheme for the room, which I think explains our approach that we were, we believed that the staircase, the form of the staircase, was so fundamental to the understanding of the space. And in fact, we did many schemes that tried to, to break away from this. Um, and each time, uh, neither the room nor the, the, the sequence through the building made sense. It was only when we rebuild the form of Stiller's stair that this room makes sense. Um, however, as you can see, we don't uh, imitate the historical uh, decoration or surfaces. So we've adopted <coughs> a sort of minimalization of the original form. And we needed, rather like the Greek vase has a, you know, a gyps uh, um, magic material that holds it together, we needed a material that would run through the project wherever we needed it to <coughs> hold the building together. We felt that it was very important that the architecture that we added to the building um, was in some sense, it had a presence and, and clearly it has, has to have some voice, but <coughs> that, that voice should be a very controlled voice and it should have some consistency through it. We were very nervous about finding solutions for each space. 
which clearly has to happen, but on the other hand, we wanted to find strategies that work through. So we, we worked with, well, I can just say this. So the proposal was wherever something is missing internally, we use precast concrete panels. These are uh, precast elements, gigantic in scale. And on the exterior, we use a reclaimed brick. This is the staircase hall last September when we had a sort of three-day three public opening, um, partly to let the steam out of the pot. There was <coughs> enormous anxiety about this project, as you can imagine, um, and a certain amount of uh, that anxiety was uh, based on uh, a lack of understanding about what we were doing. Um, there are certain vociferous historic groups that were, were continuously um, suggesting that we were, we were um, being irresponsible with the building. So the uh, authorities decided to open the building up to let the public come in. And, and in fact, while I was completely against the experiment, it actually worked very well and people were charmed by the whole process. So this is one of the open days. That's where we were. Um, last September, you can see that. Sorry, you can see the uh, concrete stair going in, and it is a highly manipulated uh, process. These columns were uh, salvaged; they were kept outside of the building. Um, we we put them back. We had to build this. This is a new construction uh, balcony, which was necessary to to complete the round tour. It was also necessary to to hold the columns. So the, the interface between the original material, additional material, and interventions is a, is a subtle and highly manipulated one, much to, uh, I mean, which may, means that dis, the discussion through this process is, is quite a complex one because each decision has to be made uh, on its own merits. This is the, the concrete going into the staircase. We are using these precast elements with different textures, either where, where, where these elements are close to you, they tend to be polished. On the floor, they're polished. And when they're on the wall, they are uh, sandblasted. Just briefly going through the um, major intervention spaces. This is the Egyptian courtyard, where we had to um, rebuild. There had been a, um, a facsimile Egyptian temple uh, in there, rather sort of Cecil B. de Milne, scenographic um, uh, uh, element. And we decided to, to base our intervention on the idea of a, a sort of temple or a columned hall. Uh, and to, uh, instead of just making a glass roof, to make the structure of the, the room uh, and the roof to somehow bind the new and the old wings together. So this was a sort of concept drawing. You can see in here we have, that's an existing wall. That's the wall to the staircase. This is a new wall here. So in this case, because we're treating this nearly as an outside space, it's bound together in brick. These are two new walls, but using second-hand bricks. This is a recent photograph where we are testing the vitrine design. There will be uh, small uh, heads from the Amana collection. I think there's 11 or 13 heads in vitrines which will go into this space, which will be exposed to the, the light of the, of the courtyard. In the missing wing, the same concrete gets used as the, uh, to create the replacement rooms. This was a full-scale uh, mock-up that we did. The proportion of the windows is based on the historical. The, the, um, the definition of, of lines and, and breaks and uh, architraves uh, is, is a, an abstraction of the historical. We create 
concrete beams and, and, and uh, rafters in a way which conceal and integrate the services and the lighting. This is in process. And this, this element, these, inter, these, these interventions are, have to go through into places where there is both uh, you know, historical fabric and the requirement for new floors. This was the Greek courtyard, a component, uh, an apse here completely uh, missing. Uh, we tortured ourselves about whether we should rebuild this, but finally it was felt that it was a necessary uh, element. Here's a recent photograph showing the surfaces of the courtyard. Um, when we arrived, the, the restoration enthusiasts were busy really restoring this frieze as if nothing had ever happened to it with cows with very sharp horns. Um, and we tried to explain them that, you know, the horns on cows and these sculptures disappear after about three years, let alone after bombing that uh, the building had gone through. And there was a sort of inconsistency at the very beginning where the restorers or teams of restorers who had been there before we arrived were enthusiastically trying to put back missing decoration. For us, it was very important that any restoration of artwork had to sit comfortably with the building fabric. This shows you the sort of situation that we get ourselves into often with uh, both uh, existing fabric, which we protect and preserve, and uh, rip, you know, exposed material and, and new brickwork uh, around the windows. And in this case, the rebuilding of the apse, rebuilding of the roof and interpretation of the glass roof. These are rather horrible mock-ups to um, anticipate where objects might sit within the, in this courtyard as we're getting very close to the installation. But here you can see this idea of uh, damage, repaired damage, the damage framed by new interventions, the new, new material somehow trying to complete and hold together and, and give back uh, order and sense to the building. Here's the project for the south cupola, the, the missing uh, dome room that I discussed. Uh, our idea here was to try and do a, a reinterpretation of the historical room and uh, we, we projected a, uh, a circular dome space on a square plan and so it's built, uh, it's projected out of brickwork to um, both in a way uh, announce the, or to, to find a connection with what's lost, um, but to replace it with something which has its own quality as opposed to just being a sort of reduced and poor version of the original. This is the built, don't, we don't have good photographs of this, it's a beautiful space. And just nipping outside quickly, this, <coughs> everything we're doing on the inside, which is, we define as, as soft restoration, in other words, um, you know, protecting the original, repairing the original, trying to, to bring the scars to soften the scars back into the surface. You can see we've had to do that. We do that on the outside. Here's original render cleaned. Here's exposed brickwork, which we've schlemmed and somehow brought, tried to bring together. Here's new brickwork completely. And here is the, the broken edge of the old. So we find ourselves with very sort of um, extraordinary moments that are nearly beyond our control. the recomposed uh, east elevation, which is now complete. I, mean, I don't have photographs of it, but it's, it's very beautiful. You can see here the, the scheme of um, original and repair, which has been carried out. Well, there's a little bit of it, so that's 
sorry, just this corner here. You can see again, uh, we cheated here. The building was destroyed across here, um, and therefore, and we didn't want to create a line between the old and the new here, or the, the, the exposed brickwork, which is completing this volume and the broken. So we continued uh, and tried to denote, the, in a way, the borrowing of this uh, facade element and created our, our line here. So this is a, you know, one of these sort of um, conditions which are, um, are, are used as bridges between uh, the gaps not because we're trying to show a strong contrast, but because the opposite, we're trying to soften the contrast. We didn't want, we felt that the violence of a, of a, of a break here would be, would be really counter the calmness of the facade itself. Here's the west facade, nearly complete. We've, this is a completely new building, which uh, takes the rhythm and and pattern of the historical. So this is the West Facade. Recent photo with the, the brickwork building as an imitation in terms of mass, in terms of window openings and proportion, and uh, in, a, in a reclaimed yellow brick which tonally has some continuity. And then you can see uh, uh, the repaired render work we struggled, we have been struggling. This is one of the most difficult parts of the facade. There was a lot of fire damage here and you can see this sort of tiger stripe effect that we're trying to get rid of, but it's very difficult. You can imagine that, that we have to stand in front of this building with representatives from the Ministry of Finance and, and all sorts of, I mean, the, the number of black limousines that appear now for meetings as the project gets closer, the anxieties from the politicians is becoming more and more expressed. Briefly through the building, just to show the strategy of, of repair, as I said before, it's a very inconsistent damage. We have moments where, uh, that are as innocent as this, just a missing piece of plaster. It's very easy. It's not, this is not a problem. You can, you can match to some degree, not exactly, but you can you can fill this in and bring some continuity. You try, in that process, you don't try to bring these two together because you can never copy this. And that's why historical reconstruction sets in because the convention is to take all of this away and, re and get it all to one consistent level. We're very happy and philosophically and physically, we're very happy with that line because it, on the one hand, it gives continuity the first experience is one of, of uh, completeness, but it's clearly also defining a, um, uh, an exercise, which is, is uh, you know, an operation. That's a very small gap. The, the problem becomes much bigger when these gaps become bigger. Here's a case of uh, a ceiling. This is in the Roman style. I'll just go to the, to the room quickly. It's this room. Uh, there's a very flat vaulted uh, space. This is the existing, this was the condition that we got that space in. You can see the original decoration pattern here, beautiful with a, with a grid, the blue sky, um, and then places where it's completely missing fragments. Um, on the paint box, we then, on every surface, every wall, every door frame, every floor, we would simulate what we believe should be the scheme, the design scheme that we wanted to achieve. So here the concept was to, sorry, the concept was to uh, bring back the grid into the plaster, so to, to replaster the ceiling with a very rough render, to bring the frame of, of the grid back, and that frame somehow then locates these fragments. So the fragments are not just floating around, you get some sense of order, you understand the original scheme, and you understand what is new and what's old. That um, 
that drawing that we do as an ambition then has to be translated into a technical drawing and becomes the method by which the work is executed on site. These types of drawings sit around the site. They're the most beautiful uh, drawings because they're used daily and they're they are marked on and they are a real tool. They're rather beautiful. So, and then this is the reality. So this is a completed version. So we've gone from uh, you know, the speculative uh, image to the technical drawing to the, to the realization. I mean, this is a, taken with a flash, so it's a bit vulgar, but actually the, the, the effect is very convincing. You can just about see the vaults here. And again, we have places where you know, a lot of decoration is existing, uh, missing plaster. In this case, uh, this was a test <coughs> we were interested in. Should we continue with the color or not? In the end, actually, uh, in this case, we rejected it. On, once we got onto site, once we did it, we weren't satisfied with that. And we've taken a slightly different approach. So here's the original. But again, you can see, here you can see the ceiling in that room. Here you can see the inconsistency and, and inconvenience of this damage where you have really fine artworks and then absolutely nothing. <coughs> Neil Biedensaal, which is a, a very beautiful room, which was quite well protected. Um, similarly, it's actually quite an easy room to repair in some ways, although because it was so, so protected, there's a, there's a feeling amongst us that it's somehow achieved a slightly too perfect resolution. You can see the patching of the of the colors so that there, there's some way of distinguishing. We've cleaned up the paintings and oops, sorry, yeah, we can see it here. And where we've got, uh, in this case, because this room is so, um, so complete, where we had big areas of water damage, completely missing decoration, we've actually gone quite a long way in imitating the, the missing decoration. So we've copied, in this case, it's nearly one of the only cases where we've copied the missing decoration because <clears throat> the whole room is at another volume. Um, a very beautiful room, which is the other dome space. That was the uh, original condition, or the condition we found it, with terrible water damage, exposed brickwork. Here's the coffer structure. Um, this is our scheme, this is what we want to achieve, suppressing the water damage, uh, schlemming the, the brickwork, uh, and patching up some of the color. This is in process, you can see that happening. Um, and this also in process, starting to suppress the damage, and then getting very close to the to the finished product. Again, the, I think because this is taken with a flash, the, the contrast between these colors is, seems to be quite extreme, but actually, in reality, it's a very soft and very convincing um, repair. And it's, of course, we've gone, we have to go further than a repair. And all of the, I mean, I'm just flick through these because they're all examples of places where we've had to, uh, we have different conditions of existing fra fragments. This is a rebuilt brickwork column to imitate that. Uh, these, cooper, these flat domes are, some of them are original, some of them are rebuilt. Uh, that's the condition, that's nearly the final condition of this room. It's a rather beautiful room. You can see we've got fragments of decoration. <coughs> we've got situations where we've, we've got uh, a, a copy, an original, a brickwork, you know, under, under structure in a way, and then Actually, you can even see the, the new concrete um, work coming through. So you see all of these different layers of, of, um, of uh, architecture. Again, this is what we inherited. We had to do a lot of rebuilding. We, we reinvented the clay pot. We had one guy building, uh, making these clay pots by hand because of the the conditions, the soil conditions on the museum island still have built the building with lots of technical innovation. One of them was to use clay pots as the floors to keep the weight down. Here we've got some of those 
rebuilt space, and then here they're painted to bring them back together. So continuously, this question about how do we um, locate these fragments and also try to not make them seem like just uh, throwaway bits of decoration, that they, they seem to, to have some logic within the overall schema of things. The ambition is that each room should reachieve a sort of integrity and its own character. There are places where the challenge is very difficult. Here's a room and, um, under the staircase nearly, uh, very difficult space. This is actually the, it's not the, quite the finished result. This is, just, this is our speculation, but the result is not far from this. Um, and it's actually become a rather beautiful uh, wall. On the top floor, we get a very different series of spaces with very different types of structure. Um, and you can see here we've got a combination of new floors, new ceiling, original steelwork, which <coughs> uh, could no longer take the load, so we had to build new beams behind the ceiling, but kept the steelwork, obviously. The last part, I just want to show the rest of the the other aspect of this project, which I alluded to at one point, which was the master plan. When we were given the project, or when we won the project, the, the concept was that Noise Museum would become a sort of entrance hall. We resisted that and um, proposed that this wasn't... We, we, there's no way of restoring this building and keeping its delicacy. It's, it's probably the most fragile and delicate buildings of the all of the buildings on the island, and it's the only one that still has this, um, you know, quality. If you go into to Shingles Alter's museum, I think you would all be, those that you have, I'm sure, are disappointed with the really crude uh, quality of the reconstruction. It doesn't have any original material left. Noise Museum does. So we, we persisted that this could not cope with, with that uh, function. Um, and then we were invested with the responsibility of solving the problem in another way. We, are, we have planned and agreed and have half built a number of links underground, which will link the Boda and the Pergamon. This part of this is built. Uh, we've built connection here, and part of this is built here, which will connect the Altus Museum. It will allow there to be an internal connection. The other issue the infrastructural issue that the island suffers from, because all of these buildings were standalone buildings. Noise Museum, as a museum, was built in, in, uh, at, the, at the time when you, know, you would ring the bell and someone would open the door. So the infrastructural elements of such buildings were, are not there. Um, how do we deal with visitor numbers and all of the things that that, that will bring? Um, the concept then is to add a new building here on the Kufergram, which will become a sort of orientation, a reception, and it will contain all of the more dynamic elements of a museum complex, auditorium, changing exhibition, cafes, shops, and all of those things. But um, it, it will have a serious program, but as much as anything, it's a sort of entrance hall for the island. Um, this shows you the the, the promenade, so-called, connecting all the buildings underground, which is necessary for the reasons I explained before. That, yeah. And this shows uh, our project, which received funding last year and will start next year, uh, for a new building on the Kufa Ground. Briefly, I show this slide because I'm just going to go across the river to this building, which is a completely separate commission. We completed a, a gallery house here. Um, uh, for a private uh, collector. It's a four-story gallery building completing the block uh, with uh, very beautiful gallery spaces, which, although it has, it's a completely you know, independent 
commission has nothing to do with the museum island. In some ways, the, the completion of that building has helped the, the, it's helped us broker the entrance building project with the general public. We first did a project for the site um, as part of the master planning concept. And this was a sort of the first project we did. And this contains, this is a programmed box with exhibition spaces, um, uh, orientation space, tickets, um, yeah, changing exhibition, auditorium, cafe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was a pro and, and it links to the, the archaeological promenade underground uh, and had the potential to link into the program. The, this was a sufficient project to promote the idea, to get the idea accepted politically and to receive financing. However, it was very difficult, I think, to bring this project further. And the reason why was, I think, that um, I, I think we hadn't yet, there was an issue about architectural language, but as much as anything, I think, as a feasibility study that this was, it hadn't yet quite developed its purpose. And while it, its purpose was described by all the functions that were inside, it still hadn't yet found its real um, destiny, I suppose. Partly, I think, because we hadn't had the full dialogue that was necessary with museum, the, the general director and, and museum curators, because the project was not, at that point, feasible. Once the project was funded, everybody became very excited and their attention shifted onto the project, at which point we had the opportunity to reconsider the architectural strategy. Um, and we, we really started again, and we tried to think what was, not what was the function of this building, but what was its purpose. The real purpose of the entrance building is to, to give to the island uh, a series of spaces which do not exist in the existing buildings. We have to anticipate the reception of, you know, six or seven coaches at the same time, the unloading of, of uh, you know, popular tourism, as well as the ability of, you know, single tourists to arrive and, uh, um, without, you know, for all that congestion to happen in a comfortable way. And <clears throat> to create a sort of place of arrival and orientation for the campus, if one sees this as a campus. And that problem is accentuated because the front doors of these buildings, one is here, one is there, one is there, one is there, and one is there. The front doors do not face each other. Um, so this building has a sort of strange responsibility, not just as a, as a series of activities, but nearly as a public place. Um, if you go back to Schinkel's Alters Museum, this is the famous drawing from the first floor, uh, from the main uh, floor. Uh, what is extraordinary about this image, because we have to think that in, in a way this is nearly the first public museum, uh, is that Schinkel has managed, here's the Lustgarten, the Schloss, there's the Schloss. Uh, there's, you know, in a way, the, the most representational space of the Prussian Empire. This is public space. Now, to get from there to here, where these guys are, uh, you are not actually entering a building. You, don't, uh, you, you do not open doors. You can flow through the colonnade, up the stairs, and here. These people are, in a way, in a sort of public space. And the definition becomes through this colonnade and through the space. So this seemed to, to us to offer uh, a great sort of example. Here's the colonnade half that goes around the, the island. Again, you know, a beautiful definition of, of uh, space which helps you circulate in a sort of non-institutional way. Here's how the colonnade addresses the um, spray on the spray side. Here's a noise museum. And here's how the colonnade addresses the front of the noise museum. This is now put back in place. Luckily, we managed, you know, or 
the columns were, were protected and saved. They were taken down and put in storage. We've now put them back. And therefore, we changed really fundamentally, and this was, and I apologize for the sketch, but it means something to some of us, uh, which was, I, I nearly sort of caricaturized the, the Mises National Gallery. I mean, I nearly sort of sketched Mises National Gallery on, on top of a base, and I said, well, what we really need is a public protected space, but where it's achieved some of this quality that I've just described. So the scheme that has evolved and has been approved now <coughs> sort of extracts out of the colonnades. It becomes a linking device. Uh, this is the colonnade hoff here running around. This is, our, this is part of our new building from here on, runs around and runs back to here. Uh, this element here is another colonnade in a way, a building as colonnade, which connects into the Pergamon, which is a sort of new requirement which we have. So we link, through this building, we link also the basement connection, the colonnade connection, and the first floor uh, loop of the Pergamon. The building then disappears into uh, a sort of strategy. The language seems to satisfy both the historical context in one way, without being literal. It is at the same time both in some ways historicist and minimalistic. So you can read this, this quite austere uh, frame in, in both ways. It sailed through uh, public and media um, scrutiny um, and to politicians. I mean, it, it became something that people immediately uh, understood and could imagine in this place, which was quite different to the first um, volumes. While I think that <coughs> the process, I mean, some people have felt that maybe this therefore was an exercise in compromise. I think actually the process of trying to find solution that binds together uh, both physically and historically this uh, extraordinary complex of buildings um, was something very positive and something that we, we're rather um, proud of. Thank you very much. Very good, thank you. Thank you very much for your explanation on Neues Museum. And I'm sorry we are missing ruins in Switzerland, but we are sure that we get a very sensitive design building here in Basel and in Zurich, and we are looking forward. Ich möchte mich auch noch mal bedanken bei den Leuten, die diese Veranstaltung möglich gemacht haben, bei den Architekturdialogen, meinen Kollegen bei der Messe Basel, bei Regent und bei Emch Aufzüge, die das ermöglichen und möchte Sie auch einladen, das nächste Jahr wieder an unseren Vorträgen teilzunehmen, die ich Ihnen eingangs angekündigt habe. Die einzelnen Namen und Daten werden wir Ihnen rechtzeitig mitteilen. www.architekturdialoge.ch weiß auch immer mehr und das Neueste. Für die, die noch ein, äh, etwas trinken wollen, gibt es noch eine Bar äh, in der Vorhalle. Und ich danke Ihnen und David Schipperfield für das Interesse. Danke vielmals.